Stewart. I'm a faculty member in the School of Public Health uh, at Georgia State University, and I serve as the program manager for the Partnership for Urban Health Research here at Georgia State. Uh, for more than 10 years now, we've had a lecture series uh, on various urban health topics uh, once a year. Uh, last year, our speaker was Mr. Tim Keene, who is the planning commissioner for the city of Atlanta. Uh, before that, we had Mr. Paul Morris, who is the executive director of the Atlanta Beltline, Inc., the uh, organization that's developing a building and then promoting the Atlanta Beltline. Uh, we've had uh, Dr. Sandra Galea, uh, who is the Dean of Boston University School of Public Health, who is one of the world's foremost experts in urban health. Uh, we've, um, we've had Dr. Howard Frumpkin, who is a world-class expert in uh, climate change and the built environment and health. Uh, we had Dr. David Satcher, who was formerly director of the CDC, formerly the Surgeon General of the U.S., and now with the uh, Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, and many other uh, distinguished speakers. So uh, we hope that there's some honor and prestige that comes with uh, the opportunity to present to the uh, Urban Health Lecture, and we're very happy this year to have the uh, head of the uh, Fulton County Commission. Uh, uh, speak to us, who I am greatly relieved to tell you he's just going to be. <laughs> so let me ask the question that I ask all of my urban health classes. Where would one go to visit the Atlanta City Health Department? Do you know where? Does anyone know where? Would they would go to visit the Atlanta City Health Department. Where do you go? That's right, there is no. That's a trick question. And that's because uh, in Fulton County and City of Atlanta, like all counties in Georgia, uh, counties are responsible for operating the public health agencies uh, in our state. And so uh, that in Fulton County, the Fulton County Department of Health and Wellness uh, provides a, a comprehensive program in public health and they're responsible to the uh, uh, Board of Health and to the Fulton County Commission. So uh, uh, our speaker this morning has a great deal to say, say about how uh, public health operates here in uh, Fulton County. So let me thank you for coming to the uh, 2016 uh, Urban Health Lecture. Uh, I wanted to uh, recognize a couple of the visitors that we have, and if anybody slipped in that I don't know about, please uh, please identify ourselves. Uh, first of all, we have uh, two visitors that are in the Humphrey Fellowship at uh, Emory University School of Public Health. Please you want to stand up so we can recognize you. Thank you very much for coming to Georgia State. Uh, we. Um, uh, are there any other universities besides Emory and Georgia State who are represented here this morning? Okay. Uh, we have Dr. Nazira Dawood, who uh, was formerly with the Fulton County Department of Health and Wellness. Uh, Nazira and I worked for many years together in uh, public health programs, and she is now the uh, Deputy Chief of Staff for Dr. Eves. So let me get on to the introduction for uh, Dr. John Eames. Dr. Eames is currently serving his third four-year term as chairman of the Fulton County Commission. The commission served nearly one million residents in 14 municipalities, including the city of Atlanta. Dr. Eames has a distinguished career encompassing academic and educational worlds, community service and business leadership, both domestically and abroad. He has visited and met with citizens in more than 50 nations around the globe. He's received multiple scholarships, honors, and fellowships uh, throughout his career. He served as director of the NCAA Volunteer for Youth Program, and he's formerly an administrator at both Post College in Connecticut and Davidson College in North Carolina. If that isn't enough, he served formally as the director 
of the Peace Corps Southeast Region, uh, which I believe is here in, in Atlanta, helping to bring education and healthcare assistance to people in South Africa, Sierra Leone, Paraguay, Jamaica, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. And then most recently, he's worked to develop a partnership with the nations of Cote d'Ivoire and Brazil to uh, structure bilateral agreements between Fulton County and those governments. Uh, while he's uh, focused on business development, he's also played a critical role in developing opportunities for Fulton County residents in transportation, housing, and health care. He's uh, also been active in youth programs like START, which is an innovative program to address, uh, to promote youth uh, opportunities. And he's been involved in reducing crime, which we all know is an integral part of uh, good urban health. Dr. Reeves is a graduate of the Morehouse College, where he uh, played on the football team, lettered for four years, and was captain. He has degrees, a master's in, uh, degree in religion from Yale University, and his PhD in educational administration from the University of South Carolina. So Chairman Eves, welcome to Georgia State University. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Stewart, and your team for this uh, very special invitation. This very special invitation. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Is that for the ca camera? For the okay. The uh, the invitation to be here. Um, running a little bit behind schedule this morning, I had a prior engagement, but I didn't panic, Dr. Stewart, because. When I was in, in college many years ago, there was something called the 15-minute rule. <laughs> and, and I'm assuming it still applies today. And so uh, very grateful, as, uh, as Dr. Stewart pointed out, with me is uh, Nazira Dawood, who is the uh, Deputy Chief of Staff. She's also sort of our health policy expert in our office. And, uh, and I'm just looking forward to the presentation and, as well as just the dialogue and the exchange that we're going to have afterwards. As Dr. Stewart was pointing out, I am the chairman of Fulton County, which is an outstanding um, position to be in to affect change, to influence people, to help people uh, in their daily life in ways that they are aware, and in many cases, ways that they are not aware. Uh, and we do this on a daily basis in terms of impacting the 1.1 million residents of our county. But before uh, getting into public office, I was, as, as Dr. Stewart pointed out in my bio, I worked for seven years as a Southeastern Regional Director of Peace Corps, based here in Atlanta. And so I oversaw the recruiting arm of Peace Corps. Many of you are <clears throat> probably very familiar with Peace Corps, uh, founded or established by John F. Kennedy back in 1961, who just basically on a college campus like this, he started at University of Michigan and said, do you want to make the world a better place? And the response was so enthusiastic, uh, he decided to start what's now, now known today as Peace Corps. And during my Peace Corps days, I would travel to visit volunteers around the world, whether it was down in Haiti or Dominican Republic or to Paraguay, South America, or to Sierra Leone. And one of the major sectors the Peace Corps had was public health. And I saw firsthand how Peace Corps volunteers got on the grounds and worked with the locals in terms of public education, working with women, working with children. And so I commend you uh, as public health students, uh, whether you're an undergraduate or graduate level, uh, for what you're doing and the careers that you're going to embark upon because you truly will be uh, helping people's and improve people's lives around the world. And um, as I was pushing Peace Corps and recruiting for Peace Corps, I had an aha moment. And the aha moment was, you know, there's great need around the world, particularly in the developing world, uh, but there's also great need here in home. And so I decided uh, about 10, 11 years ago to uh, use all my academic credentials and all the wonderful things uh, that I've gotten, cash it in, 
and, and go into public office. I, I cashed it in not to earn any money, because I'm not earning any money, but I'm certainly um, enjoying what I'm doing in terms of helping others, in terms of what John F. Kennedy mentioned, do you want to make the world, do you want to make Atlanta, do you want to make Fulton County a better place? And I'm trying to, to do that as chairman of Fulton County. So this morning, I'm going to talk with you about how government uh, can play a role in the delivery of public health and how you as students, uh, future, and, or even if you're a current practitioner, can impact change uh, within whatever jurisdiction you are going to reside and work in. I often say that Atlanta, Fulton County, and when I say Atlanta, I'm going to speak very um, globally. It's, a, it's a, a city, a region, a tale of two cities. We have some of the best that America has to offer right here in this region. We have the world's busiest airport. We're number three in terms of the number of Fortune 500 companies, uh, international companies based right here in Atlanta. We also have, believe it or not, the fifth largest number of college and university going students in anywhere in the country. You usually, th usually think about Chicago and Boston or even Los Angeles or maybe even New York, but Atlanta has it. We have 66 colleges and universities in this region that enrolls 270,000 people. Um, within our region, which is significant. But along with the positive that we have here in Atlanta, along with the good that we have here in Atlanta, along with the great diversity that we have here in Atlanta, we certainly have our share of challenges. Where in Fulton County, about 28% of the people who live in our county are, live in poverty. The metropolitan Atlanta region, the five counties, of metropolitan Atlanta, Fulton, DeKalb, Clayton, Cobb, and Gwinnett, on any given day, we have within our jails 13,000 people. And 13,000 people in our jails, same number as you do in New York City. We have 3.1 million people here, 8 point something million in New York, so we have an over-incarceration of people in the region. And many of them are people of color, in Fulton County, 90% of the people uh, in our jail are African American males. But along, among the challenges, and this is what government is grappling with here, among the challenges that we have here is sort of this forgotten um, issue, this forgotten illness, this, this forgotten disease that was very uh, first and foremost on the minds of people back in the 80s and 90s and that's HIV and AIDS. It's almost uh, very rarely talked about. But guess what? It is a problem. We are about five in the nation in terms of the number of people who, are in, uh, who have the disease and who are diagnosed on an on a a annual basis. And so I'm going to talk with you today about uh, what county government is doing and, um, and what role you can play in terms of addressing this issue. And even if this is not your issue, you may get an idea of what you can do in the future of whatever your issue, whatever your, your concern is, whatever your passion is, and how you can partner with government. I have gotten involved with this issue not because of any sort of personal experience, not because I studied uh, anything about HIV and AIDS in, in college or university, but it, came, it literally fell in my, sh in my lap. And because I want to help people out, I have made this one of my priorities. So this, this morning, as we go into our afternoon, I want to talk about um, HIV and AIDS. And so have a slide presentation. And I must say, I, I am used to talking. You know, uh, sometimes I feel like I'm a preacher. <laughs> like to give sermons. Sometimes I, I love to talk. And I'm not very good at um, uh, PowerPoints, but I'm going to, I felt because I was asked to talk for a whole hour, <laughs> at least close to it, um, we're going to have a PowerPoint, because I want you to see some of the, the statistics. So in 2008, look at the bar uh, chart graph, between 10 and 
12,000 people were living with HIV in Fulton County. And look how that number has grown, gone up, gone up just uh, six years later to roughly 16,000 people. Now, uh, the new diagnoses of, of um, HIV, this is uh, Fulton County, where the largest county in the state of Georgia, there are 159 counties in, in the state. We have the second highest number of counties as a state than any other state in the United States, except second only to Texas. So there's a proliferation of counties. I grew up in Florida, there are only 67 counties in Florida. And so there are 159 in Georgia. And Fulton County, we're the largest, the most populous. Uh, we have 1.1 million, as I mentioned, somewhat elongated north to south. And I'm not sure if you live in Fulton County or know a whole lot about Fulton County, but for the most part, the northern part of the county is, is somewhat affluent. Um, and the bottom half is not as affluent. And of course, in the middle, you have a combination of the two. And so the shaded areas, the rates of infection by, um, based on population, the darker you get, the higher the concentration. And so the highest concentrations are in the city of Atlanta and in the southern part of our county. And specifically in the city of Atlanta, uh, there is a zip code 30318, which is um, a, a stone's throw from the Georgia Dome uh, that has some of the highest rates of health disparities than any place else in our county. A lot of it is because of the, um, the high concentration of poverty. So we also have high incarceration rates, high homelessness, and also we have high rates of HIV AIDS in that part of our county. Our population of the Fulton County is very diverse. Um, I'm the second African American who has served as chairman of Fulton County. Um, these stats are a little bit off. It's actually a majority, slightly majority white uh, county. About 43% of the population is white. About 40, um, this says 43, it's really about 45% is white, 43 is African American. So that's a population breakdown, Hispanic or Latino and Asian and other make up the balance, but we're a pretty diverse county. But look at the new HIV diagnosis by race, 43% um, African American, 68%. So you have an overperformance, a larger proportionality of folks of color, particularly African Americans who are newly diagnosed with HIV AIDS compared to the white population. So now we as a county, we actually are funded by several sources to address this issue of HIV and AIDS in our community. Um, the lion's share of our funding comes from the Ryan White program, and it actually funds the 20 county area of metropolitan Atlanta. So it's a big circle around Atlanta. And last year, fiscal year 15, uh, got $23 million. We also got funding from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, uh, about $8 million. And then Fulton County, we put in uh, an additional uh, amount of money, just under a $1 million. So you're talking about big dollars, uh, 32, 000, I mean $32 million plus are, are appropriated to deal with this issue of HIV and AIDS. All right. so. We have made it as a priority. Um, African Americans between the ages of 20 and 29, uh, whites uh, between the ages of three, uh, 30 and 39, uh, African American women are high risk, those who are heterosexual, and the 30 to, 30, 30 to 49 age category. And these are some other areas that we've identified as priority areas, priority populations, in terms of how we fund. So, two years ago, I went to a World AIDS Day function here in Atlanta. These statistics and more were shared with me and others at this event. 
I was alarmed by what I heard. And so one of my colleagues, Commissioner Joan Garner, who was one of, my, one of the commissioners, we were at this function. People like yourselves were there. Healthcare uh, experts were there. Doctors, physicians were there. A lot of folks were there. We heard the statistics. And we decided, the two of us, we're going to step up. No longer can we point to the federal government, the state, for not doing what they should. The county is going to do something about it. So we formed a task force. And December 17, 2014, and our mission was to end AIDS in Fulton County. We established this task force. 14 members were appointed to the task force, along with 25 other non-voting um, members. And we've made this task force open to anybody who has an interest. And I'm going to share with you some phenomenal recommendations. So I want you to understand that policy I am a leader, but I'm also a policymaker. And when policy is developed as a government official or government leader, that's when you can truly have impact, when policy is developed. Because sometimes monies follow where the policy is. And so we established this task force as an advisory group that will recommend potential pol policy initiatives that we are beginning to adopt. And I'd be more to I'd be more than willing to share with you a little bit about the steps that you can take towards developing policy. All government has policy. Federal, state, local, which includes city and county, we have policies. And policies are what direct how monies are used and appropriated. Okay. So about last summer, this past summer, Really, this past spring, PBS came to Atlanta, and we're beginning to do this sort of this um, six-part series about HIV and AIDS in the country. And they decided to find out what Atlanta was doing. And this is just a two-minute snapshot of this PBS documentary. Train, then another train, then a bus. 
And that's just one way. That's one way. If a bus or train is late, he'll miss the next leg, and often his appointment will be canceled entirely. For these reasons and many others, an estimated 40 to 50 percent of people in Fulton County drop out of HIV care once they've started. For others, even basic information about treatment can be a struggle. Go for like this bohemian type thing. When 22-year-old Derek Langford was diagnosed with HIV, he had no trouble opening up to friends and family. But he couldn't figure out what to do next or where to go for medication or follow-up care. So it was pretty much me searching, looking, using Google a lot to find out where I needed to go. And this just kind of made me very, very sick. It's often these kinds of barriers, not riskier behaviors, that drive these high rates of infection. In fact, gay black men don't engage in higher risk behaviors compared to, say, white gay men. Repeated studies have proven that. They often have fewer partners and use condoms more, says Wendy Armstrong. She's medical director of the Ponce de Leon Center, Brady Hospital's massive outpatient clinic for Atlanta's HIV-positive community. There's so much easy blame. Those people shouldn't be doing those things, and that is not the situation at all. It is that it is such a prevalent disease in our population for a group of patients who don't have easy access to care. People living with HIV um, should be at all levels of engagement. Daniel Griffin is a member of the task force. He's HIV positive himself, and he says the Achilles heel of the fight against HIV in the South is stigma. He says even he feels it. I thought I did something wrong being that I'm now HIV positive, on top of being black, on top of being gay, and, and then the South. So this is the South, Bible Belt. And so when it comes to HIV, it's like we are doing something that's immoral to what we've been taught as children. Well, stigma about being gay has always been a problem in much of the U.S. Driffin says it's particularly an issue in the black community. And he says it's complicit in the rising rates of HIV infection. We see what happens when people do tell that they're um, gay. We see what happens when people do say that they're HIV positive. They're homeless the next morning or the same day. You know, they're being assaulted. A local man could face federal <coughs> charges. He points to a recent case where a man walked into his girlfriend's house. That was about a five minute clip. What did you see in that? What were some of the issues that came up? Transportation. Transportation? Okay, what else? Difficulty to access medical care. Difficult to access uh, medical care? Knowing where to go. Knowing where to go? Stigma. Stigma's good. So, all right, let's kind of dissect some of this. Um, what do you think, how, how does stigma impact HIV? How do you think stigma impacts it? You don't share the information with someone who might be able to tell you where the resources are. Okay. All right. You don't get tested. Good. You don't get tested. You don't take your medications. All right. Don't take your medication. Even if you had uh, reached the facility and got the services, but the mere fact that you are out there and your time for medication is due, and you are in a group of people, you will not keep your time for the medication and the evidence is Right. Did you all hear the point about how people, some people are diagnosed, and they may get the initial treatment and then it drops off? Okay. All right. some, of it may, some of it may be related to tra uh, transportation. Anything else that you saw in the, um, in the film? So now, yes. All black men. I'm sorry. All black men. Yes. So the rates of occurrence, the rates of new infections are growing in the subcategory of black men having sex with black men. And so that's sort of the, the trend is going up in that population, whereas in the white, gay, white male gay population is going down, but in the black male population is actually going up. Now, it, there's some interesting things that came out in here doesn't necessarily mean that black men are being more promiscuous, if I can use the term, having multiple sex partners, they're having fewer. But it's something that's interesting that's happening among this group of black men who are having sex with black men. So that is 
from a visual standpoint, some of what we're dealing with in Fulton County, the stigma, the, inac the inaccessibility to treatment, um, transportation, uh, follow through, the case workers of work with people to follow through, those are some of the challenges that we're being confronted with uh, in terms of why the numbers are going up in Fulton County. Now despite that, again going back to this task force, force that was formed, we have come up with uh, several very um, ambitious type goals. We want to reduce the number of new HIV infections. We want to increase access to care and improve health outcomes for people living with HIV, reduce HIV related disparities and health disparities, and achieve a more coordinated local response to the academic. So there's several things that we are doing that I think are going to be very creative, very bold, um, that will have an impact. Number one, before I talk about this campaign here is, we're going to make it part of policy and part of practice at all of our health facilities that we as a county support as well as Grady Hospital where we fund there's something called routine opt-out testing. Routine opt-out testing. Does anyone know what routine opt-out testing is? Routine opt-out testing, yes. Would I'm just going to take a guess as if that you will get tested unless you opt out and say I do not want to be tested? You're asked. You're asked if you want to be tested. You're asked if you want to be tested and then you're given the choice of, of saying, no, I don't want to be tested. So the simple question of asking is what we're going to begin to be doing within our clinics, is asking if they want to be tested. About two years ago, um, when we started this process, I, I used to get my primary care at Grady Hospital. They asked me, do you want to be tested? So just asking the question helps to get people to begin to uh, get tested as opposed to not asking the question. We don't want to stop there. We want to also advocate to all the other health care providers in the county to begin to have that as well. Now, we don't have any direct influence on Piedmont and Northside and North Fulton, but we can at least request that. Uh, but the, the facilities that we have direct access over through funding and through oversight, we can institute this as a policy. Syringe exchanges. We as a county are beginning to promote free syringe exchange. It's controversial, but we're pushing that. Free syringe exchanges. The third thing we're going to be doing is this right here, stop the spread of HIV uh, on the college campus campaign. And Georgia State is one of the places that we're going to be going to. And it's called a PrEP clinic, pre-exposure prophylactis PrEP. It means to prevent or to control the spread of an, ex an infection or disease. There is a drug on the market called Truvada, Truvada, that if taken on a daily basis and you're part of a high risk group and if one person is infected with HIV and the non-affected person takes that drug along with the use of condoms, it's about a 90% success rate in terms of not transmitting the disease. And so we're going to make this drug available along with education to the university community. And this thing is going to do two things. Number one, not only is it going to help minimize the transmission of HIV AIDS, but we're also going to try to address the stigma issue and get people to want to be tested. Know your status. Because once they are tested and know their status, 
If they are positive, we connect them to services. If they're negative, we certainly want to um, make sure that they do all that they can to minimize the likelihood of being uh, a newly diagnosed HIV person. To make this work, we have successfully gotten a major pharmaceutical company to donate close to half a million dollars. And then a major health uh, um, provider to donate $100,000. It's not a whole lot of money, but these monies will be used to hire Fulton County staff employees to work with the health professionals at Georgia State, Georgia Tech, Morehouse, Clark Atlanta, Spelman, Atlanta Metropolitan College in terms of having this on the college campus, the prep, the prep clinic. This will be the first time that a government, a local government, is partnering with the university community to offer this to college students and university students. I was given the choice of rolling this thing out with the university community or to some of the uh, other challenge areas in our county. And I chose the university community. Not that this community is any more better than uh, another one, but I felt that there would be potential synergy that can come about, a ripple effect if we target the university community. So later this year, we're gonna make a formal announcement and hopefully launch this program uh, going into next year. It's called Prep Clinic. So I'm very, very excited about that. All right. And so I kind of hit on some of these. Um, We're going to be expanding the prep, we're going to eventually exp uh, expand the prep services to other high-risk individuals uh, in our county, but we're going to target the university community at first. Okay, the other thing that we're going to be dealing with is the criminal justice pipeline um, and its connection to HIV. You'll be shocked about this criminal justice component that I mentioned earlier. So, whenever a person is arrested in a county by a local police officer, they go to the county jail. So anybody in Fulton County who's arrested, Atlanta, Sandy Springs, Union City, they're for the most part taken to the Fulton County Jail. So, we have a jail that has 2,500 beds. 2,500 beds. Guess how many people were booked in the Fulton County Jail in 2010? 2,500 beds. 2,500 beds. Over the course of 365 days, how many people you think were booked into the Fulton County Jail? 2,000, just guess. 10,000? 10, 8,000. 8, Higher. 100. 1,000. 100,000. Well, more than that. 15. Good guess, so 15. 45,000. In 2010. Now, for the past five years, we've been putting an emphasis on diversion. Instead of going to jail, taking them to a mental health facility, to substance abuse uh, facility, treatment center. So 45,000 in 2010, last year, 26,000, a significant reduction. But when a person goes into our jail, 
They have what's called a medical assessment. Check for their mental makeup and do a full physical exam. Can you believe that the jail is what we discover on average about 100 people are d discovered to have HIV in the jail? Because that's where they get their first medical assessment. They're living in 30318. Other parts of our county, you saw, the, you saw the, 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 the map, the high concentrations, they live in those areas. They don't access health care. They don't access the health care facilities. They're not ever asked a question about opt-out testing. They go to the jail and they don't have a choice. And about 100 people a month find out the new diagnosis. And so we're going to begin to start educating folks who deal with the offender community. We're going to have increased diversion programs for appropriate drug and sex offenses, including HIV AIDS, prevention and education. Now, I'm going to push this even further, because that's not exactly true. Because we discovered, we discovered that these people have AIDS, HIV and AIDS. Questions? Questions? Yes. Um, are there, for the task force, are there any open meetings for the public? Yes, they are. And when are they? So. It's usually every month. Mm -hmm. Yes, the second uh, Monday. <laughs> so, this is one of the issues that we're dealing with as a county. Our goal is ambitious. I went to a, an event yesterday that was sponsored by the hospital authority of Fulton County. And there still are women who are delivering babies in 2016 and transmitting HIV to their babies in Fulton County. Can you believe that they have eliminated this in Cuba? So we are making this a priority. It's not a part of the, the common conversation anymore like it was in the 80s and the 90s. But it's a silent issue in this county. But the government, the local government, and as Dr. Stewart pointed out, city citizens are impacted, but it's the role of county government. We're charged with health care, and we're making this one of our biggest concerns. And so, again, uh, we plan to reverse the tide, and we certainly will be looking for engagement for folks like yourselves who are studying about um, becoming, to, studying to become uh, public health practitioners, uh, we certainly want to engage you uh, in this journey. Yes? As the initiative is moving forward, will the task force have its own website in association with yours to give progress and updates and for those individuals who are you know, seeking information and direction, will there be some sort of social media attached to the, to the um, advisory committee? So all of those are good questions. I'm going to connect it to the question that you asked. The task force was originally established to allow um, the, the experts in our community to come in, uh, look at the problem, and come up with a series of recommendations. Now, they're probably about, I'm not sure how many recommendations there are. Um, yeah, there are quite a few recommendations. I only hit on a few of them. We eventually plan to empower the Health and Wellness Department of Fulton County to carry out uh, the recommendations that turn into policy. But there still is room for people like yourselves to be involved in this effort. You know, whether it's, you know, you can 
do an internship with the Fulton County Health and Wellness Department. Uh, I'll be pushing for our health care uh, health director to get out and have public forums. So there will be opportunities for you to uh, offer what your expertise is to Fulton County. Yes. Um, I know Fulton County just got a free prep clinic or it's just getting ready to open. How is the project going? Who are you targeting? Yeah. So we have our own pre our prep clinic and it's far exceeding our expectations. In fact, um, we, 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 we cover the cost of the medication. Uh, I don't know the, the stats off, off the top of my head, but we wrote it out, I think it was back in June or July of this year. And so this idea of the prep clinic on the university campus, that's an idea that I'm pushing because I want it to be placed in places where um, there's a lot of um, you know, young people just trying to um, in, enjoy their independence and we want to encourage, we want to interject HIV AIDS in terms of their practices, yes. Thank you. Um, clearly the, the political commitment that I'm seeing, uh, I just want to share my experience from Tanzania. I'm from Tanzania, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the branch of HIV and AIDS. Um, and um, I would really want to share what we are doing at this point in time was trying to get an end to HIV and AIDS. And um, we are advocating for community testing and you can clearly uh, look at the disparities that you are having uh, similar to ours. Access is one hell of a problem. And we've come up with a policy whereby people go to people's home and do what is called community testing. Again, there is the option of opt-out. So uh, we call opt routine opt-out, we call them provider initiated counseling and testing back home, whereby every person who attends any health facility will be tested for HIV and AIDS. I would also like to advocate for treatment as prevention. Uh, uh, I'm not opposing against uh, PrEP, but if you look at the long-term benefit of uh, treatment as prevention, that is providing treatment and making sure those who are infected take treatment to protect their partners. It has a longer term gain than providing PrEP because studies have shown that people who are normal and healthy uh, do not take medicines for a lifetime uh, on Truvada. Uh, so uh, I would, as, as you guys move ahead uh, towards PrEP, it's worth to look at studies and look at the public health and the cost implication uh, towards rolling out treatment as prevention in comparison to, to, to PrEP. Uh, and we have adopted a policy as of October 1st. We started what is called treat, uh, test and treat uh, at the same time. Again, um, looking into the uh, treatment barriers of transportation, um, we are trying to, I don't know whether this would be feasible in the United States, but Back home, we have a task shifting policy now in place which advocates or allows um, certain, not just medical doctors to, to prescribe and give medication. Uh, you can take the medication to the community level and, and, and dish out medicine on stab uh, for stable patients. So clearly the person whom we saw has been taking medicine, probably he's stable. He doesn't need all the blood tests every visit maybe six monthly or after a year, then you, you give, try and get the medicine to them uh, to, to relieve or give them more than a month of prescription drug. Um, that's the, 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 the modalities that we use. It may not be feasible here, but it's something worth considering because you are at a policy level. Thank you. I mean, those are some great suggestions and, and I don't want to mislead the group. Uh, it's not just a prep, we also have services for people who, who, who have the disease and we, we, we help them get the medication. I will say, and I'm not sure if we, we figured it out yet, I will say that the, the retention of people staying on the medication has been somewhat baffling so far. We have not been as successful as we would like. And I'm not sure if it's because of stigma or because these are marginalized, for the most part marginalized people who we're already dealing with and for whatever another, their willingness to continue with the treatment is, is, is not as strong. Yes, here and then here. Yes. Um, well, I've dealt with HIV prevention in the Western communities for a while, and I've done HIV prevention both in um, a collegiate and um, like a high school, middle school level, as well as in the community. 
And one thing that is um, a very well, very common is the lack of education, um, just in general as far as when it comes to like sex and things like that. And so with me um, doing interventions like an APS and things like that, I'm educating higher students so that they can diffuse the information to their peers because they're generally leaders. And so um, do you all have funding in your plan that you just talked about that will go towards um, furthering those efforts? Because there are a lot of nonprofits that are doing Bachman Life Skills and um, BART and things like that to do that type of education. Because if they know younger, then they can make better informed decisions. So, Grace? Suggestion. I forgot to mention that in my presentation. So, one of the, the, the recommendations of the task force is to uh, advocate for the Atlanta public school system and the Fulton County school system to both adopt a, a, a um, revised or sex education program from an abstinence-based model to one including HIV AIDS. Because as you pointed out, um, we need to begin to educate and form uh, people at the youngest of age. Uh, and so that's not currently being done in a very formalized way. Yes, there may be some groups that are doing some good things and needed things, but in terms of a school system adopting a policy, uh, no. And so we're going to be advocating to Fulton County and uh, the city of Atlanta. Both they have two separate school districts that cover our entire county, maybe 120,000 students or so. We're going to advocate that they have a, a, a revised sex education curriculum to include HIV and AIDS. Thank you for that suggestion. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to some of the collaborative efforts with other community groups that may be involved as, as stakeholders. Um, particularly, about two weeks ago, I was in a meeting with Healthy Places, and 30318 was the topic of that discussion as well, and had to do a lot with um, child well being in that particular area, um, transportation issues, homelessness issues, things that are overlapping with the conversation that you're having. And I'm just wondering um, if in addition to the collegiate stakeholder um, collaborations, if you could speak to some other community-based collaborations that may be beneficial. Great question. A lot of good questions. Great question. To me, along with this retention issue of keeping people in a continuum of care related to it, we have not quite figured out the best collaborative model on, on several fronts. All right, first of all, Ryan White's Ryan White program, we fund annually about as I point out in the slide, about $23 million worth of, of funding uh, to nonprofit organizations, um, healthcare providers who work with the HIV and AIDS community. Uh, unfortunately, um, this funding is the lifeblood of many of these organizations. And to me, there, are, there is a certain degree of self-interest that comes about where I want to do all that I can with my organization to support the group of people that I have targeted and I'm very important and it does not incentivize collaboration between similar groups who have similar audiences and so we haven't quite figured out how we can incentivize that uh, and, I, and I'll be very honest with you I'm a disappointed in that and I just think that we are fighting against some degree of self-interest that people just have that's the first thing. Number two, you didn't necessarily ask this question, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, this issue of equity, and Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, I'm going to give credit to her, president of Morehouse School of Medicine. She said, Chairman Eves, equity is not always evenly distributing resources across an area. Equity can be putting the greatest resources where the greatest need is. And we haven't figured that out yet either. And so, um, that going to, again, going back to the map I showed, the greatest concentration of HIV and AIDS is in the inner core of Atlanta. But the nonprofits that are targeting that area uh, is disproportionately few. And we have to fix that. All right, so that's, that's solution number two. Solution number three, and this goes back to the transportation issue. We have not figured out a model, a collaborative model, where you can have a strong continuum of care, not just in terms of health care, but in terms of other social determinants of health. So can we work with MARTA, for example? There's a, MARTA has something called paratransit. 
for the disabled can have uh, access to transportation to go to a clinic, their primary health care physician, or get drugs, uh, uh, medication at a pharmacy. We haven't figured out how we can perhaps include the HIV AIDS community in that. And so if I were to self-evaluate our efforts, I think our intentions are excellent. The resources may or may not be adequate, but we have resources, but we have not figured out how the resources can be utilized to stretch the furthest to get the greatest impact. We have not figured out that piece. Again, it's because of the self-interest, and I'm not hating the groups, but it's just a natural self-interest of organizations who are funded by a source, they're gonna look out for themselves. We haven't figured out how to incentivize collaboration between like organizations. We have not figured out how we can have sort of a stronger continuum of care that also brings in other factors that can boost up the person's willingness to get care and to stay in care. We haven't figured that out yet. I think that's another area that you can use at university uh, for collaboration, mm -hmm. and not just in prevention here on campus, but in utilizing students to work with communities that have these needs. We have a law and health equity class in the law school that goes out to different NPU units, um, neighborhood planning units, and 30318 has been the focus of their projects in the past, but, but those, not just Georgia State, but also Emory, Morehouse, you have students here who are very willing to be working in these communities, and maybe that's a resource that's sort of a, not a, maybe more of a financially neutral resource that could be utilized, whether it's um, medical students or whether it's um, law students, that type of thing. I, I love that. I, 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 so let me just say this, and, and Dr. Stewart and others, I, I hope you can in, figure out how to embrace and, and carry this. I've been in public office now for 10 years. I have an educational background. Dr. Stewart read it, I read my bio. I, I respect the higher educational community. But we, I oversee a county government of a $1 billion worth of revenue. Um, I'm not trying to brag, but all, well first, all, pol all politicians, for the most part, are sincere, but all of us don't necessarily utilize to the best that we can the intellectual community that we have. And, what I'm, and I'm speaking very politically correct right now, but we don't use, we're policy makers, and we don't adequately use the thinkers and the experts as much as we should. It's scary sometimes the policy that we make. And we have great intentions, but we don't tap into the resource in the university community like we can. So I would love and I will welcome you all and others to be a part of this, this solution. We can go, we can advance the ball on the football field down to the 20 yard line. But we're not going to go into the end zone unless we get you all, figure out how to get you all to help us out. That's how we've truly advanced the ball down, using a football metaphor, down the field to score a touchdown. Right here. I'm a um, gerontology major, graduate in gerontology. Too often, older adults, 55 years old, is left out in all of these routine tests and everything. So I guess my question to you would be, how could we address older adults? First of all, they are, they are sexual beings. Providers do not respect them as sexual beings. And whereas, and there has been an increase in HIV in older adults, 50 and older, as well. So how could we, as students and commissioners and politics, get, uh, get older adults to be viewed as sexual beings? and knowing that HIV exists in that community as well. Another great question, great observation. Um, so in our targeted populations, you know, it's not just black men having sex with black men, but it's, it's, it's females, and I'm not sure if we had a slide for seniors or not. Um, but to your point, uh, seniors are sexually active, and, uh, and there's sort of this an assumption that believe it or not, that you know, just because you're older, you can't become infected. And so we have senior centers in uh, Fulton County. We have, the, um, we have 
we have about 16 total senior centers. It is not part of the educational program for seniors. It is not. It is not. So we can easily uh, have some sort of conversation, uh, presentation made to them. Um, um, that's one th thought. And then, you know, I'm not sure what data we have, Nazira, but, but to her point, maybe there's a way that we can provide some sort of funding support. Um, so thank you for your question. Yes. Can you speak to HIV grants funding issues Yes. Thank you. So um, about four years ago, so her question was about the grants funding to Fulton County. We received uh, a multi-year grant from the Centers for Disease Control. And the first year that we received the money, um, it may have been about $15 million. I don't remember. Was it? Huh? that was not spent. All right, so it was about $5 million that weren't spent. And the commissioners, myself included, we were not aware that the monies were not spent. Um, and, it, and the director of the health department uh, came up with a reason why it wasn't spent. She said there were some government protocols in terms of hiring people that prohibited her from hiring staff. And um, she's no longer working at Fulton County. So we, we have a new head, and we also put some internal, process, internal protocols in place to make sure that the monies will be, will be spent. The good news is once we put the protocols in place, the CDC actually gave us back a lot of the money that they took away from us that were not spent. And so I jumped in, and we called for an audit, and we were, we, we were, we, 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 the protocols were not in place. It was very embarrassing, especially given the, the magnitude of this problem that I'm explaining to you today, that monies were not spent. But we, 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 we stopped it. We put the protocols in place. The person who oversaw the department is no longer there. We have new leadership, and we got most of that money back. So that's the good news. OK. Yes? First of all, I wanted to just thank you for coming to speak to us today. Um, I had a question about um, the prep clinics on campus um, and kind of what went into that decision because uh, research shows that there's a um, geo vulnerability to HIV, meaning that um, a lot of the transmission between um, uh, individuals comes in um, communities that are um, undereducated and um, uh, kind of underfunded uh, and things like that. And so, um, as education and income levels go up, the kind of the um, transmission of HIV, HIV and AIDS goes down. Um, so, in my research, I found that um, the levels of HIV and AIDS is lower in college populations compared to community populations. Um, and I was just wondering if you guys looked into research um, and what went into the decision between choosing the community and the uh, university. So, it's a fair question. Um, so we recently did a, uh, some testing on one of the campuses in, in Atlanta, um, and 120 people were tested, and two people were, were discovered to have HIV. Um, low percentage, still too, 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 too many. Um, so the, the statistics probably support what you're saying. We felt, though, that we wanted to roll out this initiative uh, to a contained community to a certain degree in terms of a university uh, setting. We also felt that this was a, a shrewd, a positively shrewd way to educate uh, uh, young people about HIV and, HIV and um, safe sex practices, the, mar the, 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 the medication that's on the, the, the market today. And we felt that you're future thought leaders. And so by exposing you to this, you will not only have an immediate impact in terms of educating your peers and those you interact in the community, but also in your future profession, you will have an impact. So it's sort of a strategic decision that we were gonna target this community that had the potential of carrying our message uh, effectively. But 
this rollout is not limited to colleges and universities. We're going to take it to other places in the, in the community. And, and to your point, yes, there's a, there are a lot more vulnerable populations that we can work with. And as one of the uh, questioners asked, we already have a prep clinic right now. The prep clinic is, on, is, is within Fulton County government. The, the university effort is an outreach effort, and we're going to have to have some more outreach efforts in the future. Along with that, um, I guess it kind of goes back to the point you were talking about equity, and that I feel um, university students are already kind of a step above the community, and maybe like putting more of the more clinics than more than just one clinic in the community might have, um, you know, kind of equal the playing field. So I was just curious, but. Yeah, so again, I mean, this, this is just sort of a first step. It's not the final step. There'll be other steps, and so we will eventually be going into more challenged communities. But we just felt that uh, for the resources that have been made available, this was a good bang for our buck in terms of a contained community, uh, thought leaders, it will have a ripple effect. Um, and so we just thought that it was, it was a good use of just over half a million dollars. And we had healthcare providers on the campus who are willing to partner with us. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, uh, I'm very in impressed with uh, your commitment to working with this program, as well as the interest here in this room, I think is great. And there are uh, many different opportunities for uh, students and our faculty to get involved and engaged in, in Fulton County and to uh, become stronger partners with you. So I look forward to that and hope we've laid the groundwork today for doing that. Well, Dr. Stewart, thank you. This has been a great opportunity. I didn't know exactly what to expect, but, but I mean, if, if, if there are papers, projects, um, you know, I think, I think some great questions and you've pushed me in terms of rethinking some strategies perhaps, the equity issue, transportation issue, uh, even what you share from your perspective in Tanzania. So if it's a, if it's a class project or a thesis or assignment, um, feel free to share that with us because again, um, we're here as elected officials because we have a heart, and, uh, we, but we may not necessarily have all the technical know-how to do things as, 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 as good as it can possibly be. Mm -hmm. And so you are the thinkers of our community. So don't feel that what you are discovering and learning and researching cannot be of benefit to us. And so Yeah, well, I'm very glad to hear that you're open to uh, working with us. And that's, that's extremely important for us to know that uh, we've got the potential for even greater partnerships. We have a little something for you to commemorate your visit here to Georgia State and to uh, commemorate your uh, lecture here right. today. Right. All right, well, thank you for being such a great audience and such great questions. Uh, anyone that would like to attend the Urban Health uh, uh, Seminar, we have it every two weeks in 3.30, one floor above. The uh, schedule's on the website, so uh, feel free to drop by, and thank you, enjoy the rest of your day.